This rural cameo is a time capsule that brings together the historic and contemporary aspects of an industrialized rural landscape and the individuals that have shaped it. The Ice Age left our land with a legacy of wonderful countryside, hills, valleys and rivers that have provided the necessities of life for many generations. Much of the landscape that we so much enjoy remains unspoiled, enhanced by the agricultural activities that prevail. However, some regions have changed in character, brought about by the Industrial Revolution. The West Pennine Mowers of East Lancashire is one such rural area. Here, the mowers flank the winding course of the River Irwell. The source of the Irwell can be found on the mowers above the village of Stacksteads, to the north of the Rosendale Valley. From here, the river takes a southerly course, through Rorton Stall, Ramsbottom, onto Berry, and more townships in the Irwell Valley. The changes that have taken place over time, are not just the building of factories, but also the creation of rural folklore within the social communities surrounding them. There is much evidence in the valley that long before the Industrial Revolution, this was the home of early travelers who settled in the region. Here at Whitelow, Overlooking Ramsbottom, we have a Bronze Age tumulus, constructed around 4,000 years ago. This site was used for both internment and cremation burial rites. It was excavated in the early 1960s by the Berry Archaeological Group. At the time, it was brought to the attention of the group that another burial mound, just a short distance away, was about to be demolished for agricultural reclamation purposes. Only a few weeks are left in the life of this three and a half thousand year old cairn overlooking the Airwell Valley at Shuttleworth. It is considered an obstacle to the agricultural development of the area. Tons of stone must be removed to investigate the mound, but this will avoid a more damaging removal of the cairn. The first objects are being found is a segmented fion speed, probably imported. Large capping stones and a small amount of cremated bone indicate that this could be the primary burial. The limited excavation is complete, but only just in time. Burial vessels, earthenware urns, poorly fired, contain charred bones and often personal possessions of the cremated person. Restoration, conservation and the recording of details are carefully carried out before the items go on museum display with other examples of the period. Flint implements are common finds, but a small vessel makes this burial very interesting. Clay studs were rare. They may have been used as decoration inserted in the lips or ears. A bronze awl would normally be used in the manufacture of garments.
When sorting bones, teeth are identified more easily than bones from limbs and other parts of the body. Earthenware decoration was simple and regular. Patience was the main requirement to produce these corded horseshoe and ring-shaped patterns. Across the river, in Ramsbottom itself, we find an excavation that has revealed the foundations of early industrial premises. Kibberth Crew is the site of an historic mill that was built in different stages. Dating back to around 1628, it is the oldest known industrial site in Ramsbottom. What we are looking at is a fulling mill. Fulling being a process used to produce felt. The mill was excavated during April and May 2007. 49 volunteers took part in the excavation, which was supervised by the University of Manchester Archaeology Unit. The building excavated was of a latter stage, dated 1850 to 1870. A large water wheel pit and stone engine mountings were among the features uncovered. Smaller artifacts were also of interest. What then are the individuals behind these industrial developments? Perhaps the most well-known gentleman from the region is Sir Robert Peel. Peel was an industrialist, but is better known for his contributions to the nation as Prime Minister. In 1829, he entered the cabinet for the first time as Home Secretary where he reformed and liberalized the criminal law. He created the modern police force leading to a new type of officer known in tribute to his name as Peelers or Bobbies, a reference still used for policemen today. On the 15th of September 2002, the Robert Peel Memorial built on Hokum Hill and financed by public donations was the scene of a commemorative celebration. And I call upon... I now call upon Mr. Frederick Peel, our Member of Parliament and son of Sir Robert, to say a few words about his father. It is an honour to be connected with the early career of one who, in whatever character he was regarded as a public man, as a statesman, as a representative of the people, or as a minister of the crown, was one whose counsels guided this country for its peace and its prosperity during a period of 40 years, from 1810 until 1850. In the early 1780s, the Grant brothers journeyed south from Speyside with their parents in search of employment. Attracted by the local scenery, they settled in Berry, became mill hands, and then shopkeepers. In 1806, under the patronage of Sir Robert Peel, William Grant entered into the business of calico printing and textile dyeing at Ramsbottom. It was said that within ten years, the firm of William Grant and Brothers had become one of the most famous in Lancashire and that Ramsbottom had become quite transformed as a result. The Grant Brothers, along with other industrialists, built factories and homes for the workers. One of the key industrial areas of Ramsbottom was the village of Nuttall. There is now very little evidence that the village ever existed. However, a tithe map shows clearly where the remaining foundations can be located.
just one house, remains standing. The Grants, like Sir Robert Peel, also had a memorial in their name. The Norman-styled tower was built by the brothers to commemorate their parents and the date of their first visit to Bury. However, the tower collapsed on the 21st of September 1944. Although Charles Dickens probably never met the Grants, he was said to have heard of the Grants' generosity. They are said to be the model for the philanthropic cheery Bill Brothers of Dickens's 1838 novel, Nicholas Nickleby. During the Industrial Revolution the steam railway came into fruition, and the countryside became latticed with track, and dotted with stations. The East Lancashire Railway served the region well, running alongside the River Irwell and linking all the towns and villages between Rawtonstall and Manchester. The railway became part of the LMS network, and eventually British Rail. Passenger services were withdrawn in 1972, followed by coal services in 1980. Times changed for the better when the East Lancashire Railway Trust reopened the line in 1987. The East Lancashire Railway Company proudly organizes special events and welcomes guest locomotives, some of which you may recognize. In 1977, a stretch of the M66 was opened, once again changing the appearance of the region's landscape. This 8mm movie captures how the motorway was welcomed. Linking with the National Motorway Network, the M66 has brought many commuters and businesses to the region, along with tourists, attracted to the many local events that now take place. And so, we now have the three R's. The river, now being accompanied by the rail and road, jointly sharing the valley. The hills, flanking the east banks of the valley, are a source of grit stone. It was this very stone, that the Bronze Age dwellers, quarried, to construct their burial chambers. Now, the same landscape is dominated by a much larger quarry. For over 120 years, marshals have produced, not gravestones, but a wide range of paving stones.
Although the quarry can be described as a scar on the landscape, it is not the only feature that attracts attention. Once upon a time, the region's landmarks were factory chimneys, and the monuments of those who created them. Now, the first thing we recognize when approaching the region, from any direction, are wind turbines. Lots of wind turbines. The 24 wind turbines that populate Scout Moor, not without a challenge, will soon become 29, making it the largest onshore wind farm in the country, providing power for more than 40,000 homes. Times have changed, and the countryside has changed with it. Nevertheless, it is pleasing that the spirit of all that's gone before, lives on as a cultural legacy, observed and celebrated by a community that embraces the modern, while holding on to traditions of the past. Jodie Megan Jem for you. There we are. And Roy. 